Welcome to Adult Formation for the sixth Sunday after Easter, which also happens to be the Sunday after Ascension Day. Uh, the lessons appointed for today are, first of all, from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Our psalm is Psalm 66, verses 7 through 18. The epistle is 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. And the gospel lesson is from the 14th chapter of John's gospel, verses 15 through 21. Now, when we get to the lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, this is the famous scene where the Apostle Paul is in Athens, Greece. And Athens in Paul's day is still very much a city of philosophers. And so Paul, in appealing to the Athenians, starts out by doing so using philosophic argument. Uh, this is the famous speech on the hill of Mars, the Areopagus, Ares being the Greek name for Mars. And Paul sits there and he says, look, I've been in your city for a while now, and I've noticed that you're very religious, because you have shrines to gods up all over the place. And one of the shrines I even saw said, to an unknown god. He goes on to say, in effect, what you worship as unknown, I'm here to reveal to you uh, the real god. Now, Paul spends most of this passage using the technique of philosophical argumentation. At the very end of the passage, he switches into proclamation. I'm going to read that section here. And what he says is, While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Notice he switched from the arguments he's been making about how we can observe creation and kind of intuit the existence of a divine power to, to real proclamation here that God is going to judge the living and the dead on a particular day by a man whom he has appointed and confirmed by raising him from the dead. Now, we don't get the next verse in this week's lesson. But the next verse goes on and says that when the Athenians have heard Paul say that Jesus has been raised from the dead, a lot of them just write him off at that point. They're used to argumentation, not proclamation. And we're surrounded by people, uh, and certainly our culture is one, in which we're expected to argue about everything and prove things and uh, say that it has to work in a particular you know, mathematical formula or by the scientific method. The difficulty is that ultimate truth is proclaimed, not just worked out as a formula. Uh, we are created in God's image and likeness, and so we can observe the world around us. He's given us brains, and we can figure a lot out about the world around us. And this, actually in theology, is called general revelation, that we can see that there's an order to creation and start to figure out that this points to the existence of a creator. But we cannot figure out who God really is. We certainly cannot figure out that this same God, who is the judge of all, the living and the dead, and who is ultimately righteous, will pay the price of our failings, the price of our sin, by giving his only begotten Son. Nothing in what we can figure out is going to point to that. It has to be revealed to us. Revelation involves proclamation. We are called as Christians to proclaim, not to argue. We're not going to argue anybody into the faith. We can defend the faith, certainly, 
and should. Uh, and uh, Peter, in our epistle today, is going to make a point about that by saying, always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that lies within you. We certainly should be prepared for argumentation, but we're not going to argue anybody into the faith and convince somebody who's an unbeliever, oh, here's how it works. We can proclaim. This is what Jesus tells his own apostles, and he says, go into the village, proclaim that the kingdom of God is at hand, and if people will hear you, great. If they don't, shake the dust off your feet and move on. All we can do is plant seeds. Now, let's fast forward from that to 1 Peter, where he talks about always be prepared to make a defense. This worries a lot of people. And in fact, our Wednesday night adult formation course that starts uh, this week uh, is focused on that. It's, it's, it's focused on the language of faith because one of the things that people worry about so much is, do I know enough to convince somebody else of Christianity? Simple answer that will take some of the pressure off. No. None of us knows enough to convince anybody. But we are called to know enough to be able to defend our own faith. Now let me, let me be clear about that. Knowledge, as Paul says elsewhere in Scripture, puffs up. It gives us a big head. Wisdom is to recognize that God is in charge. Love is to recognize that God's will is that we are to reach out to those who agree with us and those who disagree with us. That Jesus' arms reach out from the hard wood of the cross, that all in creation may experience the warmth of his saving embrace. And we're to be those arms. And so when the apostle, uh, when Peter is speaking of uh, always be prepared to make a defense. He's writing in a context of persecution. He's first said, don't be surprised that you're being persecuted, because after all, Jesus was persecuted, and you're following him, and you're in Christ. Be prepared to make a defense and say why you believe. Here's where we get to that nub of language. <clears throat> why do we believe? It has to be about more than feeling. There has to be a deep-set conviction that we can share with somebody else, and we worry about, do I have the words to share? And so we can talk about God experiences and say, I felt God was present when, and we start talking about something that is very real in our lives. Again, this is not going to convince anybody. But what they will pay attention to is, are we being genuine? Are we shading it in any way? Or are we being genuine and transparent? And when we are genuine and transparent and testify and proclaim to faith, then we plant seeds. If the seeds are planted in good soil, they will ripen into faith. If the person has kept the soil barren by hardening their heart in sin, the seeds will not ripen in ways that we can witness, but they may ripen in other ways. So we do need to be prepared to talk about faith and to consider talking about faith to be something normal. Uh, what's, what's the old truism in society? You know, you're not supposed to talk about religion or politics, and yet we talk about them all the time. The problem in our day and age is when we talk about politics, we tend to do so on social media and exchange views only with people who agree with us. And when people disagree, we tend to shout at each other. The problem with uh, talking about religion is we've made it a private affair. And so, we, again, we'll only share with people we're kind of safe with. But we have to be prepared for people who disagree with us, who might mock faith and act like you're stupid if you go to church. I was raised in a household where I was told that the only people who went to church were weak. They needed a crutch. I had uh, to go through a lot of things in life before I figured out that that teaching was wrong. And once I experienced how it was wrong, then I could share how it was wrong 
with others. We are formed by God in ways that equip us to share with each other. Now, our psalm today from Psalm 66 is a series of praises offered both by an individual and in community. And that is something that we are called to do in all things, times that are favorable and unfavorable, to offer thanks to God first for who he is, and secondly then, for the fact that he loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son for us in times favorable and unfavorable. Whether we're dealing with a virus or whether we're dealing with disruptions in the economy, Jesus still reigns. He's still in charge and we can still turn to Christ and give thanks for his love and for the fact that he is sovereign. Jesus makes clear how we are to live in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel here, we get chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. And Jesus starts out and makes it very simple. He says, at verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. Now, Jesus keeps it simple. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And we're going to simplify that even further, because Jesus does so himself. He has simplified all the commandments into the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. When we can keep those commandments, we are seen to be loving Christ and in following Christ to embody him. Now, I've used this illustration before, but let's go back to it. It's the cross. If we think of the cross as a vertical beam that symbolizes our right relationship with God, loving the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind. Then we see that the horizontal theme is loving each other, love your neighbor as yourself, reaching out from the center of the cross, as do Jesus' arms, to call all into right relationship with God and to abide there ourselves. Uh, the right relationship with God and the right relationship with each other comes together in the cross. And Jesus tells us that in coming together, we are abiding in the spirit of truth. Now, the world can't receive the spirit of truth because it neither sees him or knows him, because the world is trying to figure out God. We receive God, the Holy Spirit, in our baptism. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord and abiding in the Holy Spirit. Now we can be led into truth. Now we can be at the center of the cross, reaching out to those with whom we agree and to those with whom we disagree. Just as Jesus reached out and said, even at his death, forgive them for they know not what they do. We are to abide in Christ in all things, not in knowledge, but in love. So when we worry about how to make a defense of the faith that is within us, when we worry about how to share our faith with others, when we worry about how to defend the faith when it is attacked, the answer comes back to the word love. Do we abide in Christ's love? Do we reach out to all? Do we forgive? Do we keep these commandments? When we are seen to do this, we will plant the seeds that allow some who are called to come to believe. Notice what happens again in the speech in the Acts of the Apostles. Paul starts out using philosophical argument. Once he switches to proclamation, he loses some of his listeners. In the verses that follow the lesson, we don't get this week. Once he says that Jesus has been raised from the dead, a lot of people say, nah, resurrection of the dead, not going to hear you anymore. 
And so we can proclaim, recognizing that many will have deaf ears, which is why Jesus says, let those with ears to hear listen. When we listen, we can be more genuine. We can proclaim, let God do the work and don't sweat the details yourselves. And may you be blessed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.